Hi everyone, Professor Bergasser here with our sixth video looking at how we can Tellur calibrate a specific kind of source. And these are asteroids and minor bodies, uh, the rocky things that are flying around in our solar system. Uh, it turns out that IRTF specs has been really useful in analyzing these sources. And what we really measure for these data is the reflectance spectra, or essentially how much of the sun's light is reflected off of the asteroid. And so the calibration for these is a little bit different than our stars, where for the stars we're looking at, we're trying to figure out what their emergent spectra are uh, from their surfaces. Here we're trying to see how much of the sunlight is reflected back as a function of wavelength, because that turns out to be related to what the composition of the surface of these asteroids are. So for this video, we're going to be looking at uh, the following uh, steps here. We're going to First, figure out how do we know that we have an asteroid that we're, we're analyzing. And there's a few clues that we'll go through so we can see how that's done. Uh, then we're going to look at how we follow pretty much the same standard reduction process up to the Tiller calibration. So that means doing the X specs tool, uh, doing the calibrations, doing the extraction, the combination of the spectra. But then when we get to Telcore, the Tiller calibration, we're going to use a different function called X Telcore Basic. And I'll show you what features or what, what options we're going to use to specifically do the calibration for those sources. And then finally, it's useful to kind of know, you know, what I computed, is this actually right? Does this make sense? Is this what I'm looking at? Is this really an asteroid? Uh, and I'll show you a resource where you can kind of see um, potentially actually your spectrum, but just kind of a collection of spectra of asteroids. So you can kind of compare that what you got uh, makes sense. All right, so let's go to our remote computer here. And I'm going to first start by identifying uh, the data set we're going to use. And so if I go to this data reduction organization sheet, um, we are now starting to fill in some of the science topics for the observations. Sometimes we know what they are, sometimes we don't. Um, and so I'm actually going to cheat a little bit. And I'm going to use a specific uh, date here, uh, 2001-0129, which I know contains asteroids. And um, uh, mostly because I know the person who does this work uh, quite abundantly, Rick Binzel, uh, is uh, studying asteroids. Um, and so I know the data from this date is uh, of, the, of that kind. So uh, a little bit of cheat there, but we'll see how we can also determine that we're looking at asteroids when we don't know ahead of time what the science category is. So I'm going to go to my folder here uh, that contains the logs. And I'm looking at this date, 2001, January 29. So I will double click on that and get that log up in a moment. And um, while that's coming up, uh, remember that what we're looking at is uh, trying to make sure that we have the right uh, set of spectra uh, and organizing our log sheet by color. So I've already done this for this data sheet, but you can kind of see how that's worked out. Um, I'm selecting out things that I think are science targets in yellow, my calibration files in green, and my standards in red. Now I'm just going to scroll down to the middle here a little bit uh, once it catches up. You can see some notes have already sort of popped up in here. Um, we're going to focus on this target, 2000 SS164. And the reason that I'm choosing that is because actually this is one of our clues that this is an asteroid. This kind of notation year and then a sequence of letters and numbers that don't necessarily mean anything, but that actually do have a meaning, but it's a little bit more complicated to talk about. Um, this is a common notation for asteroids. Um, it's actually indicating the discovery date and then kind of the identifier based on catalog and how far into that catalog it is. Um, so that's already a clue that I have an asteroid. The other clue is if you look at the coordinates, uh, remember that when we look at stars, the coordinates are the aria deck of the star and they're fixed in the sky. But if you notice, these coordinates actually change. And I'll expand out these columns a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Um, but uh, they start off in an aria at 806.37. By the time we're done with the observation, we're all the way up to 807.07. That's 37 arc seconds, in, or sorry, 37 seconds in RA, which is actually even bigger than 37 arc seconds. Um, that's actually quite a lot of movement for, uh, for anything. Uh, and that's really an indicator that this is a star. And also you can see that the declination changes uh, almost by a full uh, degree uh, over the course of this observation. Now remember, asteroids are moving things. So that makes sense. This is an object that's moving. So even though it's the same source, it has a moving coordinate. And so this is a good indication that we have an asteroid. 
Now, the other clue that we have an asteroid or at least sets of asteroids in our data set is to look at our calibration stars. And again, I highlighted calibration stars here in red. And I know this calibration because it's a very bright uh, observation, two seconds with 20 coads. Um, and uh, if I search for this coordinate, so I'm going to copy the coordinates, go to my Sinbad page, and paste this in. When that comes up, it's going to pick this star, HD 28099, and notice the spectral type of the star is a G2V. So remember, for most of our stars, we're using A0 stars because we're using a model of an A0 star to compute what the Tolera correction is. In this case, I have a G2 star as my calibrator star. And if you think about it, since we're looking at something that's reflecting sunlight, it would make sense to use another sun-like star to compute the correction. And so that's these two clues usually tell you that, yep, we're looking at asteroid data. Uh, and it turns out there's just one little tweak you have to do in the reduction process to get to the right uh, reduced spectrum. All right, so again, let's go back to our uh, remote work desk here. I'm gonna bring up a terminal window. And the first thing I'm gonna do is CD into my reduction folder and create a new folder, um, which in the terminal you can do as make dir. And this is 2001.0129. I'm gonna CD into that directory and make my proc and cals folder. And just to check that that worked, I'll CD over here in my file system. You can also make this in the file system. You can see there's that 2001 and there's my cows and proc folders, all set ready to go. And I'm also in the right directory for running this reduction. So I'll start up IDL by typing bash first and then IDL. And good, we're up and running. And so now I'm going to start by typing in the XFX tool. And I've actually already previously set the raw path here, so it's ready to go. I'm going to go to my cows, and in this case, I'm going to use that's the right one here. Um, I'm going to use the cows that are just after my calibrator star here. So that's 2049 to 2054. And so I just have to put that sequence in here. Run my make calibration frames, and off it goes and makes it no problem. Now I'm going to go to point sources. Now, even though asteroids are physically extended objects, and they're much closer to the Earth than other stars, they're still, for the most part, going to be point sources when we observe them. So we can treat these like normal point sources. Uh, I have to make one little change here to the prefix, because um, the prefix is changing in the log sheets. And I know um, in my log sheet, the prefix is SP3, right? that first part. And uh, I'm going to start by reducing the target, which starts with 2025 to 2026. So let me put that pair in there. I'll put in my flat field that I just made and my wave cal, load that up. We'll see the pairwise subtracted image there. We'll make the spatial, spatial profiles and looks pretty clean. So I think I can just use the guess and it looks pretty nice. I'll trace those uh, lines out, show the apertures and it's pretty close. It's almost uh, right to the bottom there. So I'll keep that. And I can extract that first pair. And now I'm just going to put in the rest of the pairs, which go up to 2040, 2027, 2040, and just run do all steps. And now it's just going to run through and reduce these data, lickety split, no problem. Um, and I can kind of sit back and, and enjoy a few minutes rest. Um, and then uh, after this, we're going to go and start reducing the uh, calibrator star. So that should come up pretty quickly here. Yep, one more pair and we're there. So this is a very fast machine. There we go. All right. And now let's go back to the logs and uh, my first target for our calibrator is 2041. So I'll go ahead and put that in. 2041 to 2042, load that up. You can see a much brighter star there. Again, make our spatial profiles. Easy to trace that. So there, we'll show the apertures. Uh, in this case, uh, I could probably expand my aperture a little bit because it's not quite down to the, the bottom there. So I'll just make this 
totally fine if it's different between the calibrator and target. And that looks good, so I'll extract that off. And then the rest of the sequence goes from, let's get that out of the way, goes from 2043 to 2048. And I'll just do all steps on that. That's just three more pairs. So this is kind of review on how we do the reductions kind of at a little bit higher speed. All right, and we're all set. So I'll just close all these windows. We've got all of our extractions done. Now let's do our, our XCOM spec. And uh, first we need to set the path here. And uh, we're gonna first combine the specter for our, oops, for our target. 2025 to 2040. So I can write that in here, 2025 to 2040. Load them up. Got lots of spectra. So first we're gonna scale them. And um, you know, I'm just kind of selecting the peak of the region here. Notice that we've got quite a few discrepant pixels. So I'm gonna go ahead and just take a moment to do a little pruning. Um, let's start down here. Uh, so again, when you prune, you're, you're selecting mask and then you're selecting the specter to mask. And I'm just going to wipe out some of the, the, the worst offenders here. Um, you can notice that when we get to a lot of spectra, you get to dotted lines, which are a little harder to see here. Um, but uh, you know, it doesn't take too long to wipe them out. Uh, this one is, looks to me green. Indeed it is. <laughs> this one looks like a purple, uh, which is number 16, we'll wipe that one out. And back out. Uh, that white line looks pretty gnarly, so we'll mask that one out. And I'm being pretty generous with how much I cut because I've got lots of spectra that get co-added, so it's okay if I, you know, cut out a little bit more of one spectrum. Um, I'll still have some left over in the other bands. Uh, that looks like a big discrepant one. That's actually blue as well, so we'll just do that. And you know, I could probably do a little bit more work down here. There's a few outliers here, but for the most part, that looks pretty good. Actually, here's one you probably can't see. This is a very dark blue, one of the hardest ones to see. And that's number nine. I'll wipe that out. Okay, so that's not too bad. So I'll accept that. Um, uh, this is enough spectra. I can correct the spectra shape so they line up a little bit better. And then I save this off as my com spec file. And there we go, much cleaner, pretty actually high signal to noise, about 150 there, that's pretty good. Uh, the calibrator star was 2041 to 2048. It should be pretty fast because it's pretty bright. That looks good. Don't see any discrepant pixels there, so I can just correct the spectral shape and then save off the combine spectrum and voila. All right, so everything up to this point has been the same as we've done with our stars. Now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new tool, which is similar to Xtel Core, but it's called Xtel Core Basic. And as it's described, it's a little bit more basic of a tool, but it turns out it's all we need for the asteroids because we're not modeling the calibrator star in this case. We're using a star that is already like a sun-like star, and we're going to just use that to calibrate our, our data. So it's a smaller window than our regular XTEL core, but as usual, we want to bring in our standard spectrum, uh, which was in this case the second com spec. Object spectra is the first one. We'll load that up. Now the order has changed here. The first thing we do is now is determine the shift. So it's a little bit different. So I'm going to do that, and but it's exactly the same way we've done before. I want to take a, a nice sharp line here and use that to. Uh, to turn my shift. Now, if you look down here, um, we're having a hard time seeing uh, this line because uh, over here at short wavelengths, there seems to be a lot of noise. So what we can do is we can actually set the minimum and maximum, and I'm going to guess this maybe somewhere around four. That's not too bad. So I can kind of see the line a little bit better now. So you can always adjust that scale. So I've selected this uh, region where the telluric absorption goes up and down quite a bit. I click on auto find, you can see it. It's converging to something that's a little bit flatter. There we go, a little slower there. And that looks pretty flat. So that is just, again, making sure that the uh, telluric calibrator and the source are lined up in, in wavelength space. 
So we accept that. Now, here's the great thing. Normally, we might, if we want to actually get to the original fluxes of the star, we'd want to correct for its continuum, which means we need to know something about the Calvary star's temperature and parent magnitude. The magnitude we can look up on SIDBAD, the apparent, the temperature we'd have to look up in a reference. But for asteroids, we actually don't want the surface flux. What we want is the reflectivity. What fraction of sun's light is being reflected back? And what we're doing is we're going to divide our, our asteroid spectra by a sun-like star spectrum. That's the reflectance. So we can just say no to that part, and they don't do anything. So much easier. Wow, I wish I was doing asteroid spectrum more often. Um, all I got to do is just put in the name of the source. And in this case, when we're doing star spectra, we've often put in the coordinates. But remember, asteroids move. So the coordinates will not be very useful for referring to the source later on. So in this case, we do have to refer back to uh, what is the name of the source. And here it's 2000 SS164. So I'm going to put that in as my name. Uh, and of course, the date, 2001-0129, and construct my corrected spectrum. All right. Now, um, let me let quit out of this, because I'm going to reshow this in uh, another tool, which is XBSpec. All right. And that's just another helper tools that allow us to visualize these data. All right, and um, I'm going to just uh, zoom in a little bit so I can uh, get to the part that looks like the spectrum there. Now, this looks very different than our stellar spectra, and even the units are different. Notice it says ratio over here. So this is not like our normal spectrum. It doesn't even have the units of a flux because we're actually taking brightness from the asteroid divided by brightness of the star. So how do we know that this is right? Well. Many of the asteroid spectra that have been collected with specs have also been uh, collected in another catalog called the MIT NEOS catalog. NEO is near Earth, a near Earth object, and MIT is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who, which happens to be a program that's run by uh, Rick Denzel, who took this data in the first place 20 years ago. So if we go to the MIT NEOS page, uh, one of the things that you can do is scroll down and uh, select uh, you notice that it has a listing of the data that's reduced. And indeed, our night here, 29, 30, January 21st, or 2001, excuse me, is actually there. So if we want to kind of get a quick check of what our data looks like, uh, we can click on the PDF of the spectra. And we'll let that load up. Maybe. Maybe not. Let's try, let's try that again. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and these are plots, again, of the reflectance spectra. And just notice the patterns here. There's kind of a, a dip at one micron, kind of comes up again. There's another dip at two microns. These conveniently actually overlay with the water absorption bands we see in atmospheres. But in this case, this is actually uh, ice absorptions uh, on the surface of these asteroids. Um, and so if we go back to our spectrum, you notice we see that same kind of dip right around here, and then kind of a little bit of dip over there. Um, and in fact, if we go down, we'll actually find that this particular asteroid was observed, obviously. And you can see that it's a pretty flat spectrum, which is kind of what we see, pretty flat spectrum. So uh, the data seem to match pretty well with the reduction that this particular team has done. So you have some confidence then that you've done the right thing by just making a comparison either to just a general set of spectra, or in some cases, you can even find the individual spectrum. And by the way, I, I knew that was the case because the name here is 2000 S164, right? So that's the source, okay? So that's it. So that's how you do the asteroid reduction. Everything is the same except for that last step where you do x or basic and you're, getting out the reflectance spectra from that. Uh, and it's actually an easier tool to use, but in the end, you're still getting a nice spectrum we can use for doing some science. All right, that's it. So that's uh, uh, it for talking about prism reduction. Our next video is gonna be talking about how we reduce another format of data from specs, which is the cross-dispersed, the short cross-dispersed data. 
uh, and it's a little bit more involved, so there'll be a longer video, but you'll see how we do uh, kind of the same things, but just a little bit more in detail. And we'll catch up with that in just a little bit. See you then.